What is it about Italian food that fits Tampa's profile? I think it's just we've lost our our deep seated fear of gluten for whatever reason. I think that they're Amen. You know. <laughs> Welcome to Tampa's Table, a culinary journey. I'm Jeff Houck. I'm Vice President of Marketing for the 1905 Family of Restaurants. And my guest today is Laura Riley. Uh, Laura and I have known each other a long time. There was a period of time where we were both writing about food. I was with the Tampa Tribune. Laura was with the Tampa Bay Times. And uh, we were around at a certain point when food started to take off again in the mid-2000s. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, thanks for thanks, having me today. Thanks for That's joining great. us. Um, so tell me a little bit about what your impression is now about uh, Tampa's food environment versus, say, five years ago when the first edition of Tampa's Table Cookbook came out, because you wrote an intro for that. What span? Uh, what has happened in that five-year span of time? Well, it, it depends on who you're asking, but it certainly feels like Tampa Bay has been discovered. You know, we've seen a huge influx of. Uh, new residents right. from north of us. Uh, we've seen a real demographic shift, uh, you know, much younger. Um, and we've seen a lot more uh, attention paid to restaurants in the area. Certainly the Michelin uh, attention does not hurt and right. kind of puts it on the map. Um, but it certainly feels like we're a second tier metro area that has finally come into its own in the restaurant and you it's know, at least risen in visibility. Absolutely. Yeah. And and people would say, um, it's. I mean, in a way, it's like Philly. People go and say, oh, I had no idea it was such a rich food scene, you right. know, with some kind of historical food, some kind of edgy new stuff, some, some you know, kind of vibey, sceny type restaurants and, and bars. I think it's uh, a similar situation where it, it, you know, it's still a little bit undiscovered, sure. um, but it's it's on the radar for a lot of people or people who are interested in food nationally. Well, it's one of these places that, unlike Miami or Orlando, it's not a hub. It hasn't been a hub, and it's been allowed to sort of marinate in its own juices, so to say, in an impolite way. Um, but it's it's had its own food culture, but it hasn't been as much of a crossroads as, say, an Atlanta has or a New York or some of the bigger cities. Um, but now I've noticed, and I don't know if you've noticed this as well, is we're starting to attract talent instead of talent leaving here and going to other places. You know, we still have some impediments in that we don't have a, a – a real uh, culinary university college or whatever. There's not a program here that is kind of nationally notable. Right. And that's always going to mean we have to import young talent, you know, the kind of people coming up. Um, but anytime you get a critical mass of young talent uh, learning at the at the feet of, you know, impressive, you know, rock stars, then they peel off and they do their own thing. You know, I mean, we certainly saw that in the beer scene in the Tampa Bay area, the kind of Joey Redner, the kind of, you know, um, anchor people that through kind of coopetition, they let people work in their breweries mm -hmm. and those people peel off and, and do their own kind of entrepreneurial things. And so then you start having a legit scene. Sure. So I would say in a weird way, we had that with beer before we had that with food. Yeah, I agree. Um, the first thing I noticed was the the, as small as it seems, it was the U.S. Bartenders Guild had a chapter that opened in like the mid-2000s. Yeah. And then the food trucks happened, especially during the recession. At the same time, some brick and mortars were opening. But then the breweries came and then the, 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 the restaurants, then coffee, and it sort of stepped all along there. But it's sort of the building blocks have been building for, gosh, close to 15 years now. Um, what's the most positive trend that you're seeing right now in terms of the culinary scene in the area? Um, I think that there are a lot of interesting uh, single cuisines, and and we are we have greater representation across the world's mm -hmm. cuisines than we than we used to. Um, I think there are a lot of restaurants that maybe are a little less safe. I mean, I think if we really go into the Wayback Machine here, you know, we know that this area was uh, a trial balloon for uh, chain restaurant mm -hmm. concepts for years and years and years, and so that is going to always augur for the safest middle of the road. Uh, cuisine, right? You know, you want to appeal, you want no veto power, you want everyone to say, pretty good, I liked it, you know, the kind of awesome blossom type, sure. you know, vibe. So I think Tampa Bay got the reputation of being a safe place for safe concepts. Um, and I think that we're now seeing people taking a little more risks. Well, and the, and the, the building blocks, a lot of it, 
um, from what I remember, is that during the recession, uh, there's a reason that the restaurant scene flourished on Seminole, you know, in Seminole Heights was cheap. because real estate was cheap. A lot of equipment was up for auction. People had to, you know, were losing their jobs, so they had to go make new jobs. And it kind of, it built upon itself. And then now that there's some money in the town, you're getting higher end concepts, bigger builds, more elaborate interiors. And So this is going to sound totally like non sequitur, but I, I went to a, a, a... Welcome to non sequitur theater. I'm just going to say something totally <laughs> random now. Um, squirrel. No, yeah, squirrel. Um, no, so I went to a lecture like... 25 years ago or yeah. something in San Francisco, and it was Alice Waters from Chez Panisse right. versus Ruth Reichel, who at the time was at the New York Times. Right. And they were talking about like, you know, is San Francisco the dominant, you know, kind of best food city or is New York? And Ruth Reichel had a very compelling answer for why New York was always going to be king. And I think that it, it bears some kind of relevance to what we're seeing in Tampa Bay right now. So New York, she said, was always going to be king because you could turn tables three times in a night and that you were taking the same staff, the same rent, mm -hmm. the same, all the same infrastructure, and you were able to monetize it more effectively because you had the people that would come, you know, the early birds, the the older people, mm -hmm. the, you know, the Asian tourists, the whatever. And then you would have a couple turns of that table. And then the Europeans would be like, I'm eating at 10 o'clock, you know. And so it was the fact of that that allowed you to hire better talent, uh, have better linens, do all, you know, better ingredients, all that kind of stuff. And I think when you have greater uh, demographic diversity in, you know, and that's what we're seeing in Tampa Bay, um, that allows for a broader, uh, at least for dinner, you know, a, a broader or a wider dinner window, which allows m m recouping money better. You know, I mean, you can you can pay your people a little bit better. As as we know, there's a lot of incentive right now to to you know pay people well and give people health insurance and all the things that ten years ago uh, were it, not it's, it's on not the just table. a demand; it's a federal mandate. It, yes, exactly. But I mean, it's it's are you doing it because it's the only way you can keep your people, or right. because you know, the man is telling you to. It's it's a little of both, right? And you mentioned San Francisco. You wrote for the San Francisco Chronicle. I sure did. Um, you know, a lot of people would say that's the aspirational city to aim for. Some might say Chicago or whatnot. But Tampa seems like it has its own voice now for the first time in a long time. And it's it might be a little bit scattered. There might not be as straight a line between, say, Cuban and Spanish or, or things like that. But it, it seems like it's it's the voice is more modern, you know, and, and, and as Miami has developed, uh, especially in the past four or five years, I've had people from Miami call me and say, so what's it like to live in Tampa? People who are born and raised in Miami aren't recognizing their city as much anymore because it has just so exploded there in a different oh, way. Oh, it's so expensive and, Exactly. You know, so uh, they're looking at Tampa, and, which yeah. I never expected. The, the, when I knew Tampa was just starting to catch on was when I would get email at the Tampa Tribune from people in Miami saying, I'm coming up for Cigar City's Hanapu release. Where should I eat? And I'm like, oh, we reversed the flow in a way I didn't expect. Yeah. And when Cigar City started to draw people from around the country was significant for that you know reason alone but they were also on every can telling a story of tampa with every can that left the city sure and that hadn't happened since the have a tampa cigar days you know <laughs> before so my time right? it, way before, <laughs> before thank your god time. for that <laughs> barely but yes yeah. um but i thought the exportation of of that story was significant um so when we talk about the business of food right now i i can't think of anyone whose timing is better than you, because that's been the whole frame for the past four or five years, especially the past three years, and all the inflationary pressures, all the labor changes. You know, I know that a lot of restaurants are looking down the barrel of this September, and then the following September, and then the following September for minimum wage hikes. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, insurance prices are going crazy. At the same time, property and ingredients are going crazy. How do you prioritize what to cover when there's so many targets? A total scattershot approach, like okay. hair on fire. Cause, no, it's it's a beat that's really grown. You know, if you think about the past three years, five years ago, if I'd said supply chain disruption to someone at a cocktail party, they would have just Glazed. stepped away, yeah. you know? And now it's like, oh, yes, where's my stuff? You know, I mean, everybody's kind of engaged in 
the provenance of their food either because it's missing, right. you know, or because it's crazy expensive or because they care uh, from a climate change perspective, you know, what's the, the carbon footprint of their food or, you know, human health stuff. I think a lot of us are a lot more health conscious than we were maybe right. five years ago. So um, where my food is from is definitely a huge focus for a lot of people. Um, and kind of like, does this food comport with my moral compass. What am I eating and what does it say about me and how I feel about the world? Yeah. In a weird way, it's like, you know, people have always had kind of what I wear, what I drive, what, you know, my handbag, all that kind of, maybe not for you, but like, you know. Come on. Yeah. But uh, no, I I just mean the (laughs) the handbag part. Um, You know what? I have a satchel. I don't have a handbag. I have a satchel. A a man, a Merce. You know, I don't go all the way to Merce, but (laughs) I think we understand what we're talking about here. So, but anyway, I mean, I think more and more (laughs) what we eat is a a reflection of our values um, in a lot of ways, what we feed our kids. So I think that there is a lot more attention on, you know, on food. And also just from a restaurant perspective, we have this idea that restaurants are this kind of um, static, defined thing, that we right. know a restaurant when we see a restaurant. Right. And that's in flux. So if nearly half of the money spent in restaurants right now is in a drive through I mean, that's a terrifying but true fact. That means that nearly half of restaurant uh, dollars are not eaten at restaurants. I mean, we saw the past three years, we've seen so much takeout, so much delivery, so much third-party delivery. So there's this blurring of the lines about what's a restaurant. And we saw the kind of the ghost kitchen phenomenon, which was, I think- The ghosts and the ghosts. Yeah, the ghosts was a little overblown. And I think some of that, there's been a pendulum swing back the other way. They used to call that a commissary. Exactly. You know. Ghost is just a little spooky, right? right? You know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but I I think that the the point is- um, what a restaurant is is in flux, and that we are going to start seeing. When we are seeing a lot of um, di- direct to consumer sales mm-hmm. from food companies, from you know full meal companies. I think we're we're you know all the kind of Blue Apron, Hello Fresh, I did all it of for those. A while. Are, yeah, we all did it for a while, and then we said, and yeah, everything showed up the at three hundred tiny baggies. Everything with one showed garlic. up at seventy two degrees in the box, and I was like, you know, yeah. I don't think I want chicken from them. Yeah. You know? Anyway, but I mean, it's the, the, that concept has had some challenges, but what's emerged from it is that um, direct to consumer uh, sale of finished meals that suit your dietary restrictions, mm-hmm. your tastes, your whatever, that you can turn on, turn off, that you can manage without having to speak to a human. Because right. I think increasingly we don't like to speak to humans. So if you can, you know, so there's a blurring, like, is that a restaurant? What's a, re- you know, if you're having food delivered, does it matter if it's from a brick and mortar? Does it matter if it's, you know, could it just be from Amazon Fresh or something like sure. that? So I think that we're at a an inflection point in terms of how we eat and where we uh, source our food mm-hmm. from and the whole kind of I think there'll always be the experiential go out with your girls date night you know celebratory sit down in a restaurant and be nurtured right. I think that will always be an impulse but I think a lot of the the um, quick serve the ca- frat, fast casual the casual restaurants the family kind of mom and pops are um in a kind of a Darwinian existential moment, and some of them will absolutely go away and be supplanted by some kind of direct-to-consumer products. Um, so anyway, so I don't know if that's doom and gloom, but it definitely feels like an interesting thing to watch from the sidelines. Well, the fact that it's changing doesn't mean it's doom or gloom. It's just changing. Well, I mean, it just it means usually there, when there are winners, there are some losers over here. Sure. So there will be some, you know, the in, some loss in the independent you know, kind of day-to-day type restaurants. And well, we're already seeing it. We're already seeing it. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've noticed a lot of the new restaurants in Tampa, especially in the Water Street area, have gone to the table side preparation. You know, you go to Hotel Aya and they're doing, you know, flambe at the table. Um, you know, and you look at the Columbia has been doing it that way for probably three or four generations. It's sure. part of the experience. And, and my intuitive sense is that the more you can make it customized at the table, the stronger your existence will probably be because that will be the thing that will separate you. It might just be longer in between visits that you go to a restaurant like that. Sure. Um, and I work with uh, younger people in my department who um, they won't go anywhere. Not, I'm not talking about fine dining or, or, or sort of sit down dining, but during the week, their everyday food existence uh, they won't go anywhere where there isn't an app where they can order and pick up. 
Sure. And you know, whatever that has to happen for a, a restaurant, it's it's easier for say a McDonald's or something of that magnitude, or fa- uh, you know, a quick server, a fast casual. Um, but a mom and pop can't it's just t- pop an app out. They and, can't. It, you know, it's, it's prohibitively expensive yeah. to you know. I mean, it's like thirty thousand bucks, right, yeah. to do something like yeah. that. You know, this morning I'm watching television and I'm seeing. I actually still watch television. They're saying, "Oh, just pinpoint on a on a map, and we'll deliver it to wherever you are." So that customized approach. It's like, okay, you're leading the way. How can we do it for our business as well? And it seems like Tampa has rediscovered Italian food. It's coming out in all different kinds of places. You know, we just talked on another episode with Eric Freilich of. Koya and Noble Rice, and he's coming out with a concept that's Japanese Italian because he remembers the Italian restaurant that he had he went to when he lived in Japan. Mm-hmm. What is it about Italian food that fits Tampa's profile? I think it's just we've lost our our deep seated fear of gluten for whatever reason. I think that there. Amen. You know, <laughs> I do think I think that there was a <laughs> the it's the um, anti carb thing is is kind of finally dissipating like a you know we got through baking for a period of time home yeah. baking is like well we've weaned ourselves back on bread we're okay yeah bread's um, okay Pasta's but it's in Tampa's okay. DNA I mean Italian is in Tampa's DNA from Absolutely. the earliest days no, sure uh, I don't know that that's the direct link but it actually fits what the history historic narrative has been yeah um but they're they're each one is kind of taking that one's going a little contemporary one's going more rustic one's more you know casa santo stefano is historic you know and then you look at eric and he's taking something and putting two things that don't seemingly go together and you know it'll be magnificent okay, I also he is think magnificent. i'm gonna just throw it out that this is pasta is also uh ingredient wise fairly affordable so you can keep your food cost under 30 percent if if you're focusing on that and then it's also depending on if you bake it if you yeah, buy yeah, it yeah. or if you overseas totally it, you know? totally yeah, you're, yeah. you're right i mean there's a lot of variation but also it is um one of the best cuisines to accommodate everyone's yeah. you know it's you can go vegan you can go veg it's very easy to have four people seated at the same table right. eating wildly different things in terms of their you know kind of dietary uh sure. predilections yeah, and it's a very vegetarian friendly, you know, and so that makes it versatile. Um, one of the menus that I saw online for a restaurant that just came out you know, within the past week, there were no prices on it, but there was GF, 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 vegan, 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 vegetarian, vegetarian. That was the symbols that they went for because yeah. they understood the shorthand of that who they were trying to attract. And that also seems, not that we're behind the times, but it seems like we're finally catching up to the fact that there might be six people in your party and one of them is vegetarian. That's going to be the driver as to where you go because what's easiest to do. Sure. Um, well, I think I've always been hyper aware because my kind of eight best friends, there's a, a vegan, a vegetarian, a pescatarian, uh, a low FODMAP. I mean, it's like a what, nightmare. A what? A a what? Lo- <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry. I don't want to mock her on Sorry, a show. Sorry, you just made my Low uh, FODMAP. It's a, you know, for people who have like a GI kind of just grumbliness, okay. you know, it's a way of kind of minimizing, just sure. make, eating foods that are a little bit easier on the gut. Okay. And what about the rest of your friends? They all kind of suck each in their own ways. Oh, well, you know? I'm sorry to hear that. You yeah. need new friends. You yeah, want to go out and we'll have lunch later. I'm an <laughs> no, omnivore. I just am saying that, like, I, I think that, you know, we all have a little bit of that right yeah. now, right? I mean, we all know someone who is, you know, whether it's a permanent thing or a temporary thing, they're, you know, it's not just dry January. It's like vegetarian February. Sure. And, you know, so I think that at this point, every restaurant knows you can't just put the side dishes together and right. call it a meal. You have to have like actually have some forethought about, yeah. you know, how to accommodate people who have any of those kind of dietary. You have to. You, know. you can't just accommodate. You have to accommodate with uh, with quality and value. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you try and slough it off and just say, well, we have, you know, onion rings that are gluten free. It's like, mm, no, no, that's, that's just weak sauce. Yeah. You know? Um, so when you want to, I'm, I don't know, do you still go to as many restaurants as you used to when you were that would doing be restaurant cooking? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like I used to go to 200 restaurants a year. Yeah. So I don't, we're not gonna be able to see this, but you see that right there? That is my chef's knife. Uh, uh, Your you callus. Know, callus. Yeah, I've got one yeah, right here. That yeah. developed over the past three years. I yeah. mean, I really, have, I go to a yeah, incredibly. Got, I feel like a, uh, like a stegosaurus here with a. Yeah. Yeah. From just the cutting. You know? So, yeah. So I really, I, the past three years, I got way back into cooking, uh, which was a delight because, um, you know, I was I went to culinary school and then I promptly became a restaurant critic and basically never cooked right. for like 29 years. So it, it's been kind of a, a treat to get back into the kitchen. So what do you cook for, 
Well, and, and you know, we had this conversation with a couple of, of chefs about what do you eat when you're at home? Because everybody has this fantasy life about what you eat. I'm sure that they eat very uh, simply and, and minimally, right? Incredibly so. Like sandwich, you um, know, like yeah. bologna sandwich. They're, kind they're, of. they're yeah. looking for comfort and ease at home. They don't yeah. want to, you know, it's so like if you, if you, if you race in the Daytona 500, you're not going 200 miles an hour into yeah. the store. You know, I mean, you find your own rhythm. What is it that you like to cook? I cook everything. I'm very fickle. So I go and I, and I, I, may, I don't know, maybe everyone's like this a little bit. Like I go on a jag of mm-hmm. something, you know, like I'm all about this thing. Like I was got into it, Indian food, deep and hard. Um, and at this point, my Instant Pot will never not smell like curry. You know, it's just the I'm way just, it is. I'm just really pleased to hear that you're a member of the Instant Pot tribe as I am. I am, although I haven't gone um, uh, air fryer. I'm just oh, like, I, did, I know, but it's, it's just it's like so much space in oh, my, my kitchen. Goodness, it's, it's just so my whole delicious. kitchen is filled with these appliances oh, now. I, know, I actually bought I know. one for work. It looks like. All it, right. You're like the 20th person to it's say got you got to do. It's got like rose gold on it. It looks like a Kardashian air fryer. It's really? not. I use it for everything. And um, it's just fantastic. I, I take sort of unbreaded wings from the grocery store, put them in there and I crisp them right up. That's it, great. It's just phenomenal. All right. I got to do it. It's very quick. Yeah. I'll buy you one. How about that? All right. You okay. You heard it here, right, Patrick? We're okay. You send me the address, and I'll right. be there tomorrow. That sounds good. Um, but anyway, I I I have um, when I stopped food writing full time, it was somewhat of a relief because it felt like I could like eat normal again. Yeah, what you uh, want to eat, as right. opposed to what you know, like that's. What I think people don't understand that if you if you write about food for a living, especially if you're doing things in restaurants, right. you're writing what the, or you know, you're eating what the restaurant serves and what they're known for and what their signature dish is and all of that. And sometimes you're not a couple like, times. I don't want a steak tonight. You know, like right. you just have to do it. And Well, I know people are fascinated about food writers and about food critics. Um, if you could pull the veil back a little bit about what that process used to be for you, as you said, 200 restaurants a year, um, you know, people are fascinated uh, about uh, how you choose what your methods are. And, you know, nowadays, food critics don't care about uh, hiding their faces to be anonymous. It's not that anymore. they don't care, they can't. It's a, it's a, yeah. it's a fiction. Yeah. You know, it was a fiction at the end for me. It was. And, you know, and I, I would kind of, there was like cognitive dissonance. You know, I would be in a restaurant and I would know that they knew and they would know that right. I knew that right. they knew. And, and at a certain point, you're like, what am I doing? <laughs> it's like this kabuki theater kind of madness. No, so I mean, I don't know, like back in the way, you know, million years ago. So when my husband was in graduate school and I was uh, writing for the Baltimore Sun, you know, all my friends were poor grad students and they were like, nothing's ever been better. You know, I was like the the most popular girl in town because I'd take people <laughs> out to dinner. But the, the sun- But you I would take a couple people with oh, you. Yeah, yeah. It's not you're just oh, sitting totally. there alone yeah, or anything yeah. like that. But um, it, it was hilarious because the sun, if I was going to slam a place, if some some place was terrible, they would make me go back five times. And I literally couldn't find someone to go with me the fifth time. They're, everyone's like washing their hair that night at a certain point, you know. <laughs> um, but so, yeah. So, I mean- I cannot tell you how many times I got food poisoning, how, you know, how frequent, you know, you have to eat like the normal person. You probably go to, I don't know what, 50 restaurants in a right, year, right, something like that. Maybe. And a bunch of those are repeats of the places that you really love. I never got to, it was always like the shark swimming forward. I never got to go back to that place I really enjoyed because it. it's always like, well, okay, I'm in safety Harbor and I got to go to the, you know, and it's always that like weird Sudoku game where you're like, okay, last one I did was high end. So the next one I do has to be affordable. Right. Okay, I did a Japanese, a you know Vietnamese. Now I have to do something Western or you know whatever. So you're it's always this weird game of um, making sure there's full representation in terms of cuisines, in terms of price points, mm-hmm. you know. And then you also if you if you're not careful, you get the like the the letters saying you know you're just some fancy pan. I, not all of us <laughs> can afford you know not that not to talk that's the like correct you know, tone of voice by the way. Yes, that's the way I always read yes. my letters. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, so, you know, it, it's a it's a very strange game um, to put together, like, here's what I'm going to do. And, you know, and then there are tons of restaurants that you go to one time right. and you go, oh, dude, this is going to die under its own, in yeah. its own grisly, yep. quiet death way. I don't need to contribute to this. So I'm just not going to, you know, so they're probably, I don't know, 40 restaurants a year that I would go to once, say, I don't need to tell people not to go here because it's not going to be Correct. here in three months. Correct. And it's not, it's just, it's like not nice to, you know, to kick a restaurant when it doesn't even know it's down. <laughs> so anyway. So and there's there, a lot of those. There's a lot of those. And yeah, I remember yeah. writing about a place that wasn't necessarily ready for the exposure <laughs> that I was going to give them by writing about them. And 
wound up killing a couple restaurants from saying this is a really great place, but their either their service model wasn't good or their business sense wasn't good, and it broke my heart to to do it. But you know the way I always saw. Um, and I wasn't a critic, but the way I always saw it is that the restaurant critic is really a consumer advocate. Oh, totally. And it's, and yeah, a lot you're not of people, writing for the restaurants, you're writing for a lot of readers. people see it as some ego platform. And while it might be that for some, I guarantee you nine times out of 10, all the thought that you just talked about goes into how you choose what you write, how you say it, how you display it, the reporting. Cause the other part of it is, is there's reporting that goes on after you've been there where you call the restaurant and say, tell me about this dish or tell me about the particulars, who owns it, how long you've been in, get all the basics of it so that you can write a full bodied review. I mean, everybody thinks you just went, ate on the company dime, took your friends, that's it, it's over. And it just isn't so. It's incredibly complex consumer advocacy kind of thing. And I'm wondering if, if, if you're still seeing that as a trend in food criticism or is it just, uh, you know, has Instagram sort of taken over the... Oh, no, it's it's absolutely still that way. Okay. Um, you know, and like Tom Zietzema from from the the Post, I mean, he's a reporter, right? Right. I mean, it, it's a, at a high level, it's a, it's a very kind of unsexy service journalism job, you know, and you, 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 most people are not taking notes in real time, but you know, some go to the bathroom and take some notes so that they remember what to ask later or what was in this, or I didn't understand this dish or is this the way it was supposed to be? And that's another thing you, you always eat it the way it is sent out. Mm -hmm. You know, you never sent that food back. You never ask for something special or customized. It's, you are just eating the food the way it was intended, you know? Um, But yeah, I mean, I think that there are fewer and fewer critics, even as there are more and more people who are writing about food in one way or another. Right. Um, And some of that is because uh, social media, and I guess I'm going to include, you know, kind of Yelp and and those kinds of things, um, are now more of a meritocracy than they were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when online reviews started, I mean, we know that there's fraud. You know, there is some sure fraud is. in online reviews. But when when all of these kind of platforms, whether it was Urban Spoon, some of the early ones, when they started, it was, um, you know, the worst restaurant I've ever been to followed by the best. And like the second one is like, that's welcome, the chef's welcome, mom. The first one was to my like, day. yeah, yeah. So, you know, there, there wasn't, it was really hard to put together a vision for what this place is like. But right. once you start having a critical mass of 5,000 reviews of a particular restaurant, a very clear picture emerges. And it I think does. and I think also, I mean, pictures have really helped. I think that the Instagram, you know, a lot of especially young people, I think, will choose where they want to eat with no text at all based on the pictures. You know, it's like, oh, I relate to I can see myself eating this dish sure. or this makes sense to me. And it's not just yum, it's something like I see myself here, you know, whether it's the interior or these dishes like speak to me in some way. Sure. You know? Um, so I think that there is less call for people who are straightforward restaurant critics. I just think it's less relevant. I think we all are more engaged in, maybe we're all a little bit more uh, willing to be critical. I think that, you know, online reviews, even for things like Amazon, you know, you buy a new pair of shoes or a luggage or whatever. And I think we're all a little bit more conditioned to share our views on things. And, and that does actually provide rough justice over time. Well, and even the the sort of the fraudulent reviews um, are sort of smothered over, I think, with actual real experience. Um, I see a lot of performative reviews. I see a lot of things where people are like, oh, I'm going to write it in a way that I remember reading as I was growing up or whatnot. But regardless, there's still eventually, you know, um, a, a balance to it. And it's funny you talk about about photos because – I used to tell chefs, I'm like, you're in the restaurant business, but you're in the publishing business. And every plate needs to look camera ready and perfect. Uh, even the lighting that you have in the restaurant will affect how your food is viewed. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was a reporter, I was embedded on the development of Yulele for two years. And I saw the place that they were going to use and it had like little licks of flame around it. And then it said Yulele at the bottom. And I just thought, oh, that's just so, that's just too much. And then Instagram was born after Yulele came out and it was genius. And there was something about it that was just so 
retro smart about it. And now you see it sort of everywhere with the branding of the table. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everything matters and you can't be overt about it. But at the same time, you're trying to, to um, convey a, a, a performance stage of the table that has a uniqueness to it, you know? Yeah, but there is loss associated with Instagram. I oh, mean, sure. I think there's, so first of all, some of the world's most delicious foods look like dinty more beef stew, they do. you know, or dog food or something. I mean, it's like you a really a beautiful, like- You take a Ropa Vieja, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll so, I mean, there's so many like <laughs> classic dishes, you know, boeuf bourguignon or, or, you know, duck confit on right. like, you know, French lentils or, you know, there are some dishes that are like, that's a pile of brown goo, you know? <laughs> so I think that we do, if we eat with our eyes, if, if Instagram is king and you have all the, you know, flights of this verticality and, you know, like, you know, like the flying buttresses of hoo-ha on right. the plates, there, you do lose a little bit, <laughs> a little you bit. know? And, and then I also think that another downside of Instagram is intellectual theft. You know, I mean, a, a trend can move within days now. So something that a, a, a cuisine or a thing that is born, I mean, I'm gonna pull an example, like Nashville hot chicken, something like that. It's born of a place and to particular people. And it's immediately co-opted and like, you know, is everywhere all at once. Um, and that's not always a good thing. No. I mean, I think that it means discourse is faster. I mean, it, it's it's like it's like what does Twitter do? You know, well now Twitter is in in its own <laughs> immolation period. Yeah. But I do think that there's there's a benefit to all of us having the same conversation because of things like Instagram and a real loss associated with regional integrity and difference. Sure. Well, I've noticed in the past month, there's been three new restaurants and all three of them have Parker House rolls, only the variation on one was that they were black. One was like made with like charcoal? some sort of charcoal. And, oh, it's very good, it's very flushy. Oh yeah, that's really <laughs> what I wanna do is be flushed at $40 a plate. <laughs> Uh, but it's, at the beginning of dinner, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, like that's this, what I'm looking for. This Parker House wildfire has spread because somebody saw it somewhere, and then everybody's like, "Oh, we got to do it." And I'm like, "Why are you serving a loaf of bread before we have and even it's kind appetizers?" Of a little bit sweet too, right? It Parker is. rolls are—I yeah. mean, I made Parker rolls. Yeah. They're a little, little bit like there's a little I mean, sugar maybe in a the... slider with that, but that's okay. Yeah. You know. yeah, yeah. Um, so no, but... the intro that you're writing for Tampa's Table. What are you focusing on this time? Well, so I was charged with looking at farming in Tampa. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I'm doing a, for the post, I'm doing a big agricultural product project this year with this famous Dutch photographer. Um, so Tampa is um, kind of behind a lot of cities uh, in terms of regional farming. And some of that is just a climate, straight up climate. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a bunch of months out of the year you know, it's the inverse of a lot of places, but a bunch of months out of the year where it is very hard to farm anything. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't have a tradition. We don't have, I mean, it, it, for years and years, there wasn't a way, if you had a significant backyard garden and you had surplus, there wasn't a legal way to sell it or right. do something with Correct. it. So we were a little bit slow to farmer's markets um, relative. And some of that is also um, climate related, Correct. you know, so you have a slightly older population for, for decades and it's a little hot out there, you know, there, so it hasn't been, regional farming here hasn't been incredibly rewarded, I think. Um, it's also hard, as we've seen with restaurants, to incorporate local product. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really cumbersome. It's really expensive. It's just the air traffic control of it is very- It's a distribution issue. You know, yes. I mean, there was that period of time where um, you know, John Matthews at the Suncoast Food Alliance tried yeah. to connect so, the what dots. What a great guy! I mean, he was a visionary, but yeah. it just didn't it didn't work out. It was the, a little or before its time. We're I think. so spread out. It's not like you're just hitting Manhattan. And you go boop 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 boop. You know, yep. it's so spread out. It's a distribution problem. But you know, we're we're the food basket for so much of the nation for so many months. It's like why can't we get that? And he did a great job at connecting it, at least starting the conversation on it. Yeah. But you know, like for instance, um, I was talking with Andrew Tambuzo at the Boozy Pig the other day mm -hmm. on Cypress in Tampa. Third generation Tampa butcher. He has his little eatery there, but he gets his pigs from a woman in Pasco. Is that Rebecca? Rebecca. Yeah. And Rebecca's tired. She's done. And he, she's been doing it a while. She's been doing it long. It, it, Talk about she, a pioneer. It does not look easy. No, no, no. I follow her on. Uh, on I've been to the farm, and, and it is not easy. Yeah. And and so he didn't want to lose the quality of his product because her pigs were so outstandingly raised and humanely raised and well done. And they live a good life until one very bad day, you know? And he bought the farm. And so he <gasps> oh. is now going to, I go, dude, you're a butcher, you're a restaurateur, and you're a farmer? 
that's the pressure. Wow. It's like, if you want to preserve the quality, what do you have to do? Wow. And so, you know, you have that, that generation that really cares. I look at him as sort of the flag bearer for the next generation of mixtos or Cuban sandwiches. He calls it a mixto. You know, they really care about their product. They really care about what the sourcing is. They have to price it higher because of who they are and the, and the logistics of what they have. But farming's hard. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, you know, you, you drive 20 miles that way and they'll tell you to your face how hard it is in certain months um, to just have enough to get by and then get through that fallow period before it comes back in the fall, you know. And so I'm 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 excited to hear about your project and, well, and to read there, your there's, intro. There's a lot of um, exciting stuff happening that is mostly under glass, right. whether it's, um, you know, Con, you know, climate control kind of, you know, indoor vertical indoor verticals, or yeah. just, and, and unfortunately we've seen a lot nationally, we've seen a lot of bankruptcies because they got a lot of VC money for a while. It takes a ton of money to get up and running. Yep. And then you're selling lettuce, which is not like a cha-ching kind yeah. of product, you know? So it takes a very long, you have to have a real long vision and you have to have really yeah. deep pockets to weather, to get to that kind of beta period of, sure. you know, so, you know, there is a, a, but there's a lot of progress being made in, in Tampa Bay, but also kind of nationally. Um, and it, it's necessity. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are absolutely not going to grow things. Certain foods that humans eat, we are not going to grow it in dirt 10 years from not now. In the, no, not, so, in the, not in the way that you know, we're I mean, you look at all the, the Colorado River water issues or, you know, so Yuma, so Olympic, you know, there, there are some very significant parts of California and Arizona that 10 years from now just won't won't sure. be produce baskets. So yeah. we are going to have to find another way to do it. And I think with kind of LED technology and recirculated water systems, you can do it without soil. I mean, yep. You can and and do it successfully. And so the, the question is, you know, how you how you get through the the three or four years where it's not at all profitable uh, to get to the other side. Yeah. Thank you for joining me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you again. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You can read Laura's article in the Tampa's Table, a culinary journey cookbook that comes out this fall. Look for more episodes of this podcast on YouTube and wherever you find podcasts. And thank you for joining us.